Hello everyone, welcome to Soapbox Theology. We're going through the next section of Timothy, and we're finishing up chapter 4. This is verses 11 through 16, so I'll begin with the reading of the text. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech and conduct, in love and faith and purity. Until I come, devote yourselves to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have which was given you by the prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them, so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so you will save both yourself and your hearers. So if you'll recall in the text that we looked at before, uh, Paul had told them to put on these things before the brothers. He has to put on these things before the brothers. He has to hold the faith, recognizing that everything was created by God, verse 2. Uh, he also has to stand his ground, because the Spirit says expressly in later times, and will depart from the faith. So he has to stand his ground. He has to put these things before the brothers, and being trained in the word of faith, having good doctrine that is followed. He has to do nothing with irreverent silly myths and training himself for godliness. And then we talked about it before, training, uh, bodily training is some value, but godliness is better. So, uh, for this end we toil and strive because we hope is set on the living God. So these are the kinds of things that he has to command and teach. He has to t teach, like, you know, bodily exercise is good, but godliness is so much better, so much more important. And he, he tells them, command and teach these things. This is what you're, you're supposed to be doing, keep doing this. It's interesting here, there's a lot of similarities between this and Titus, and rightfully so, the, the two sets of 1st uh, and 2nd Timothy and Titus are the um, pastoral letters. But he says, let no one despise you for your youth. The, uh, in, in, in Titus chapter 2, he says this to him as well, although I don't think Titus is considered a youth. In, in Titus 2.15 he says, declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no one disregard you or um, ignore you. And so there's this idea as, 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 they bring the, as they bring the teaching, as they're consistent in proclaiming the gospel, they're bringing these things and setting them before the body, they aren't supposed to let themselves be ignored. You know, people are just like, eh, I don't want to hear that, and eh, no, interesting. He, it's not interesting. They have to make sure they are presenting it consistently, faithfully, and that they are being heard. It's not supposed to, like, well, kind of like a, like a, a meek and... Uh, <laughs> like uh, yeah, we're presenting it in a in a way that's like it's take it or leave it and like it's in other words it's not just a suggestion but as he says in verse one command and teach these things so when you're when you're presenting the word of god don't present it as an option don't present it as just my opinion present it as the word of god Command and teach these things let no one despise you for your youth that was a certainly a, a situation for timothy he was a young guy, and there was the temptation to write him off as a young guy, but he wasn't. He was supposed to stand up as a faithful, faithful pastor uh, and to proclaim these truths. It says, but set the believers an example in speech and conduct, in love and faith and purity. So not only is he supposed to command and teach these things, he's not supposed to allow them himself to be ignored, but he also has to be an example in speech and conduct, love and faith and purity. So. The pastor isn't just a guy, and, and we've actually seen this a lot with, with past, pastors um, have more, having moral failures, or they're having secret sins, or they're completely unaccessible apart from the preaching. They preach, but they're, they have no other kind of relation relationship to the body. And that's not actually the way that it's supposed to be at all, because they're supposed to be examples in speech and conduct, love, fa love faith, and purity. How would you know that? If all you know is he just gets up and he, you know, he gives a mean sermon, he, he's a good speaker, do you know anything about his life? And so the pastor is supposed to be living amongst the body, being an example, being someone that the people can talk to, that the people know, that the people trust, that they see him living out the things that he's preaching, not that he's just a great orator. And we're missing this a lot today in America in the body of Christ. We have great orators who we find out later are living double lives. And that would be a lot more... Uh, difficult to do if you're amongst the body, if they're your examples in speech and conduct, love, faith, and purity, impurity. Uh, so he had to also be an example personally before the body. And again, this is something that's um, repeated over in Titus as well. 
So let me let me look over there. But as for you, again, teach what this is Titus two chapter one. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. And then he go, begins to exhort older men and and younger men and then young women. Verse seven: Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an, an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. So again. The leader isn't just a guy who's good at speaking, who's good at communicating, who's good at exegeting the scriptures, who's, who's, who looks great up front. He has to also be lit. He has to also model his teaching. He has to live it himself. He, and th this is the point. He has to die to himself. When a preacher, when a, when a preacher is standing up and preaching, he has to have, um, taken the teaching on himself he has to have examined himself he has to have been putting it in practice himself or else he becomes disqualified again going back to the James verse not many of us should desire to become teachers because we will be held under a stricter judgment even if we're great at communicating if we're li living a, a, a double life a secret life if we aren't controlling ourselves in conduct and speech and purity then we have no business being up there and we're just putting this this level between us and the flock that is not supposed to be there. A, a, a pastor is supposed to be transparent and accessible to the flock, such so that his life is a model that they can that they can follow up an example. So, again, uh, Paul's very consistent in in these two letters to Titus and Timothy. He's telling them basically the same thing. Verse thirteen: Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. This is one of those verses that's really important for church. Like, why do we tr do church the way that we do? Why do we read the Word of God? Why do we exhortate? Why do we teach? Why is that kind of the main thing that happens on a Sunday? Here's why. Verse thirteen: Until Paul, until Paul comes, he's saying, do this publicly, right? Read the Scripture, exhortate, and then teach. This is what you're supposed to be, be doing amongst the body. Certain, certain men are raised up. Again, Timothy and Titus both have, we looked at them earlier, have requirements for what an elder is supposed to be, especially a teacher, a pastor, able to teach, right, all of these things. But his main job is to be proclaiming these truths amongst the body of believers. That is what they are supposed to be doing. This is why church looks the way that it does. And also on top of that, we, we, know, that we're, we know that we're supposed to be gathering together in worship and singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So a combination of those two things is basically what makes up most church services. Uh, is would be considered worship. Not just the singing is the worship, but the singing and the public reading of the scripture, recalling the things that God has actually spoken into the world and holding them as authoritative and true and binding on the church. And, you know, if God is the head, then we are the body. And so we listen to the head as he speaks. We direct our lives according to his truth. So um, public reading of scripture, to and then there's exhortation based on that, based on the, on, on the scripture, there's exhortation, and then there's teaching, there's instructing the people. And, and again, this is... The pastor has to be modeling this stuff. He's not just saying it, but he's living it himself. This is what makes up the church. This is why church is structured the way that it is. This is why the main elements haven't have largely been the same throughout time, and everything else is just kind of ministries that we add on. Verse 14, and this is actually interesting. Do not neglect the gift that you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. So this is actually a cool thing. It's kind of a, a it's kind of a referring to, if if you if you will, his ordination. There was in a sense where he he has gifts. They were acknowledged before a council of, of elders. They were even prophesying over him, speaking what is true. They laid hands on him and they commissioned him for the work. So he, he was acknowledged before a council of elders. They acknowledged, yes, you have this gift. Yes, if you go back to earlier in the book, the, the qualifications for being an elder and a deacon and certainly a pastor, there was a council of elders that recognized that Timothy had these gifts and then they, they, they prophesied on him, laid hands on him and sort of released him to do this work. So he's not to neglect that that happened. He's not to neglect that God has given them these gifts and those gifts were acknowledged before a council of, of believers. This is why or I, I personally, I just went through an ordination process. It was a five hour, five hour interrogation based on a 40 page paper that I wrote to be acknowledged in the, in the e Church of America. 
but it's important for that that pastors are ordained, that they're um, qualified, that they're examined to see whether they're in the faith. That people are questioning them on how they would how they would lead and what they believe about the word of God. These things are important and these things are consistent. There's a reason that the church does these things. It, it's not a small deal for someone to just say, well, I'm going to be a pastor, and they sort of appoint themselves. And there's no accountability, and there isn't any kind of review, and there isn't any, any reason that they're standing up apart from they just want to do it. Again, going back to James, not many of us should desire to do this because we'll have a stricter a stricter punishment. But those that God have called need to be reviewed, need to be examined, and then need to be blessed by another council of elders. So it's actually important, ordination. Don't don't think lightly of it. Verse 15, therefore practice these things. It doesn't say therefore, I'm saying therefore. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. So again, this is what the pastor does. He studies, he reads, right? There's books. He reads, he studies, he reads, he studies. He's filling himself with this world, with this world of you, with the history, right? You're in the word, you're learning the word, you're learning the biblical languages, you're learning how to interpret, you're learning how to put them into practice. Why? Because the pastor, first of all, has to be convinced, has to be changed, has to be challenged, has to be modeling all of these things in life, in conduct before he just gets up and presents it. See, there's a lot of people who want to be pastors because they think, man, God loves me and he's amazing. I just want to tell people. It's like, that's great. But beyond that, do you know what the Word of God says? Do you know how to handle the Word of God? Do you know how to interpret the Word of God? Do you know how to present the Word of God? Do you know how to model it in your life and put it into practice so that you have something to turn and give to others? Have you been trained? Have you been challenged by the Word of God before you're presenting it to other people? This takes life practice. We have to immerse ourselves in them so that others can see your example. Again, you we're doing this before people. People should look and see, man, he's grown. Man, he's continuing to just put God first. Man, he's pursuing Christ. I want to be like that. In, in some sense, that is part of the calling and the responsibility of the pastor is to be an example, and other people need to see you growing and, and giving your life to it. Verse 16, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so you will save both yourself and your hearers. So again, this, this idea, as, as the pastor puts these things in the pra pa practice, as the pastor is submitting himself to the Word of God, right? We come to the Word of God, and we learn what's true, and then we change ourselves according to the Word of God. We don't come to the Word of God and say, now I don't agree with that, now I have my own philosophy, now I have my own goals, my own teachings, my own <clears throat> you know, pet projects, and then we put place that on the text. No. We come to the text... We let it change us. We become changed by it. And as we, as, as we keep a close watch on it, we understand that that is something that we are accountable to. So then we have to persist. It says, persist in this, or by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. The pastor has to be very careful, watching himself, watching his teaching, watching on what he's saying, watching how he's living, and then persisting in doing so. You don't just arrive one day at a spiritual peak and then now you're just you just kind of have the mantle of, of ministry and leadership no you have to persist you have to keep going you have to stay the course so that they'll save themselves and their hearers or to avoid all of those pitfalls to avoid end up being one of those leaders who has a moral failure who has a secret double life all of these things are so clear and, and th these books pastors need to be in these books reading these books leaders need to be in these books we have to be held, held accountable to the Word of God, not simply just happy that we hold an office and then lord that over people. We have to be held accountable and changed first and then present that, the Word of God, to the body. So, again, this is what this book is about. Paul's instructing Timothy. Timothy, in turn, has to, turn, has to instruct the church and how important it is for him to be living a life uh, that's emblematic of the Word of God and of following Christ. And so do we all. So do we all as leaders. So, yeah, uh, that's the end of chapter 4 of First Timothy. We'll move on to chapter 5 next time. Thank you guys so much. Bye.